Okay, folks, get seated as quickly as you can. Okay, while we're waiting for the projector to, to kick in. Okay, while we're waiting for the projector to kick in now. Okay, folks, if you, before you compare answers, there are there were two versions of the quiz. There were two versions of the quiz. It was exactly the same quiz, but with different numbers. And hey, folks, class is up. Right? Just people like you down. Okay. So there are two versions of the quiz floating around. So depending on which quiz you got, the answer is obviously going to be different. They were exactly the same degree of difficulty, the same type of problem but the numbers were different. Here's what I hope and pray I don't get. I don't want to see a quiz with a perfect solution to the other quiz. That's going to be really difficult to explain away. So if you're sitting next to somebody and you decide to copy everything they did, God help you. You might as well throw yourself at my mercy right now and be done with it because there is no way you can explain that away. How you got the perfect answer to the other quiz. Now, if your question is, why didn't you tell us? What business is it of yours? You have one quiz in front of you, do the damn quiz. What difference is it? Two quizzes, three quizzes. So the, the way this will work is uh, Nick is going to put the quizzes in alphabetical order while we're finishing the class. Nick and, uh, um, and, and Sriram. I think Sriram is, is out, but Nick is going to do it. And then I will start grading tonight. And I will keep grading and grading and grading till I'm done grading. And I don't like to keep quizzes around, so you'll be, you'll be here for me sooner rather than later. So once I'm done grading, I will send you an email saying your quizzes are done. And I will put them out on the ninth floor of KMAC, which is the finance department outside, in alphabetical order, face down. That's why I asked you to write your name in the back. If you didn't, not a big deal. I'll write your name for you in the back, but try to write your name in the back because and just go pick up your quiz. Don't browse through, see what other people got. This is in Barnes and Noble. You know, it's in alphabetical order. You can't tell me you're confused about where your name is. It's exactly where it's supposed to be. Pick up your quiz and I will send you the solution, the grading template when I tell you the quizzes are ready to pick up. Check your answer. I screw up. So if I screwed up, bring the quiz back and I'll be glad to regrade the quiz. 
So don't sit there and choose, hey, he screwed it up. He, no, he got it wrong. I'm going to screw up. I've got you know, 500 quizzes to grade tonight and tomorrow. And I'm going to get really tired around 11 o'clock. And I'm going to do some stupid things and miss something. That missing something could work in your favor. And I'm, I'm pretty sure none of you is going to bring that back to me. But if it works against you, just bring it in our regret. Okay. So let's pick up where we left off. We were talking about the projector doesn't seem to be coming on. So let's talk about growth. We were talking about analyst estimates of growth, right? And I said, when you present this to analysts and say, how come you guys are so bad at forecasting future earnings? Their defense is, it's not us, it's those guys outside. The bad analysts are pulling this down. If you focus on the very best analysts, you're gonna get much better forecasts. And I left you with this, this thought of, hey, there's a group out there that is anointed as the very best equity research analysts. They call the all American analysts. So in every sector, you get a particular analyst kind of focus on that. This is the analyst we're going to track. Okay. So those all American analysts are regarded as at least the highest profile analysts out there. So those analysts must be much better at forecasting on it, right? But when you look at the evidence tracking all American analysts, here's what you get. You find that in the year before they got picked as all American analysts, they're actually a little worse than the average analyst in forecasting earnings. So clearly, forecasting accuracy was not one of the things that people are focusing on picking analysts. You know how all American analysts are picked? They pick based on voting. You vote for the analysts in each sector. And guess which analysts get the most votes? The ones who are mentioned, the Wall Street Journal or CNBC. You have a high, if you have a high profile analyst, even if you're completely screwed up, you will get more votes than somebody nobody's heard of. But here's the magical thing that happens in the year before. Thank you very much. In the year before, they, they are all American analysts. They actually do a little worse than the average analysts. The year after, something magical seems to happen. They actually become a little better than the average analysts. It's like a testimonial to self-esteem, right? I make you an all American analyst, all of a sudden you think, more. no, it's got nothing to do with self-esteem. What do you think happens that allows all American analysts to go from being a little worse than average to better than average after they get anointed? All American analysts. How, what does it make, you know, how does it make them better forecasters, you think? Anybody want to give it a try? Yeah. Now remember what I said? Once you become an all American analyst, it becomes part of your name. You're no longer Joe Brown equity research analyst. You're Joe Brown all America equity research analyst. Before you became an all American analyst, you called the company and you try to get information and they brushed you off. You work with Brown's Harriman, not big enough for us. I'm hanging up the phone on you. You call again after you become an All-American analyst, Joe Brown, All-American analyst. They put you right through to the CFO. Access improves. And when access improves, even with the marginal information you're fed, you become a better forecaster. Now, what about recommendations, right? When analysts make recommendations, you see them reported on CNBC and the Wall Street Journal. So-and-so has put a buy recommendation on Tesla. When all American analysts put out buy recommendations, the stock price goes up by 3%. Not surprising, right? Big analyst, big name. But here's the follow-up. If you track those stocks for about six, eight, nine, ten 10 weeks afterwards, the 3% goes away. It's completely bounced and then it disappears. But when they put out a sell recommendation, the stock drops about 5%, but it actually continues to go down. What does that tell you? And this is true, not just for all American analysts. Sell recommendations from equity research analysts carry more information than buy recommendations. And think of why. Early in this class, we talked about the ratio of buy to sell recommendations. Remember that? There are nine times as many buy recommendations as sell recommendations. I said, analysts hate to use the word sell. They will use all kinds of language to get around it. So when they say sell, it's because something is freaking them out, something real. The bottom line is, there's no evidence that all American analysts are better forecasters, but they do have a bigger impact on the stock price, especially on sell recommendations. So I've thought about this for a long time because you know, I've been teaching this class 36 years. A lot of people have gone through this class. Many of them have become sell side equity research analysts in spite of my trying to talk them out of it. Some of them actually head equity research departments and investment banks. And these are bright people. So the question I have is, 
Now, why is it that so many bright people spend so much time on this process and they're not doing better? Why are their forecasts better? So I'll throw out a few hypotheses. I can't prove any of them. And if you know somebody in sell-side equity research, you're planning to go into sell-side equity research, think about these potential reasons why sell-side equity research is broken. It is broken. It's broken in the sense nobody believes them. You put out a buy recommendation, big deal. They've lost credibility. So here are the five reasons I think sell-side equity research does such a bad job. The first is what I call tunnel vision. Remember I said how I said sell-side equity research is structured. You're given a sector and then you're told to track 15 companies in that sector for the rest of your life. So if your sector is entertainment software, you'll be given 15 or 12 or 11 companies in that sector and say, track these companies 9, 10, 11 hours a day for the rest of your life. You see how tunnel vision comes about? After a while, all you can think about is these 11 companies. You forget there's a world outside and a market outside that you can learn from. Here's, here's how it, uh, you know, it plays out. If you're a dot-com analyst in the late 90s, you tracked only dot-com stocks. Every dot-com stock traded at 50 times revenues. So if you had a company trading at 40 times revenues, what did you say? That company looks cheap. You hang out with NBA players. If you're six feet, three inches tall, you're a shrimp, right? Basically, everybody else is seven feet tall. Your frame of reference is completely screwed up. I think we need to restructure sell-side equity research so you don't end up tracking the same 12 companies for the rest of your life. You need to get pulled out of there and given a sense of what is happening in the rest of the market. You think that's common sense. Why don't they do it already? Because your job gets in the way. You've got to put out recommendations. You've got to do it tomorrow. Where's the time to get perspective? The second reason I think sell-side equity research is so stymied is lemmingitis. Remember we talked about lemmings? You don't want to be part of the crowd. You want to run over the cliff. When sell-side equity research analysts estimate earnings, they often come back and revise those earnings. And when they revise those earnings, it becomes public knowledge, right? Wall Street Journal says, XYZ analyst who works for Goldman Sachs has raised his estimate of earnings for Tesla for next quarter from 35 cents per share to 38 cents per share. If you see that news story, track the news for the next 48 hours. You know what you're gonna see? A lot of analysts tracking Tesla are also going to revise their earnings upwards because this guy raised it first. There's this tendency to be part of the crowd. If one analyst raises earnings, 15 analysts will raise earnings. If one analyst drops earnings, 15 analysts will drop earnings. You notice how magically people have turned against stocks like Zoom and Peloton. And these are equity research analysts who told us to go buy these stocks a year ago when these stocks were soaring. And now that they've dropped, they say, no, no, we never meant that. How convenient. Lemming items. Third is, a version of the Stockholm Syndrome. You heard of the Stockholm Syndrome? Stockholm Syndrome is when you get taken hostage. And after a while, you start to identify with the hostage takers rather than, it's like money has gone crazy, right? Money has just a bad show. But in general, Stockholm Syndrome is you get taken hostage, but and you start to identify with the hostage takers rather than the people trying to rescue. You're saying, what's this got to do with sell-side equity research? If you did not know better, if you think about sell-side equity research and this is people who research companies and put in buy and sell recommendations, you want them to be adversarial with the company, right? You want to get too close to the company. You want them to ask tough questions of the company to uncover the truth. The problem is when you hang out with the same 12 companies for the rest of your life, you start to know the CEO, you play golf with the guy, you hang out at the same clubs. And after a while you forget your job is to ask tough questions of the company. I've seen sell-side equity research analysts get up at meetings and argue with shareholders to defend the management. That's Stockholm syndrome gone crazy. And then there's factor phobia. You read a sell-side equity research report. It often runs like 85 pages, a lot of color pictures, big stories, especially if it's one of those big markets, AI, cloud computing, a lot of macro storytelling. I'm okay with storytelling. In fact, I believe you should tell stories to value companies, but stories without numbers just become fiction. 
And there's a final factor to keep in mind. You work as a sales side equity research analyst at an investment bank. Remember, you bring no revenues into the investment bank. Sell side equity research is a cost center. So how does the investment bank make its money back given how much money it's paid you? So they don't do it for charity. Nothing that investment banks do is for charity. So how do they hope to make their money back? They're hoping that the people who use your research like it so much that they will trade through you, that they will do other business with you. You see the potential for conflict of interest? You're a sell side equity research analyst. You want to be tough on the company, but the company says, look, we're going to use Morgan Stanley for our next debt issue. I know there's a Chinese wall supposedly between equity research and the rest of the bank, but you can already see why this conflict of interest is going to make it more difficult for you to be honest in asking questions. If any of you are planning to go into sell side equity research, I want you to think about these issues. They're not going to go away. They're only getting worse and ask what needs to change for this business to find its footing again. Any questions on sell side equity research? And so if I were to summarize what we've learned by looking at, at, at what analysts do, here's how I'd summarize. First, when you think about, no, I don't know who you value, who, what company you value? Yeah. So <laughs> hey, go where it's darkest. Pick Burbank and value it. Now, this is the time to do it. Remember, I'm not kidding. If you're valuing a Russian company, don't give up on it yet. This is the time to do it because everybody's fleeing for the exit. So, no, so, so who are you planning to value instead? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Who are you planning to value? Neo. Okay. Neo. Chinese automobile company that's still losing money, lots of growth, but NEO is tracked by analysts. There are analysts in Hong Kong, analysts in, Sh in Shanghai who track it to project growth. If you're doing Tesla, you have dozens of analysts tracking Tesla. You're saying, so what? If you go to Yahoo Finance and you go to S&P Capital like you, you can get the estimates of earnings growth that these analysts are making for your company. First, what metric are they forecasting growth in when analysts forecast growth over the next five years, which is the growth rate you can pull off Yahoo Finance? What's the metric they're, for, uh, they're forecasting the growth in? It's not revenues. It's not EBITDA. It's not operating income. It's not even net income. It's earnings per share. Remember that. But let's say you sit down to value your company. You put in a 3% growth rate for your company, and then you check Yahoo Finance, and you see that analysts are projecting a 15% growth rate for your company. Before you email me and say, should I change to 15%? I want you to think about why you're so tempted by you. Because you're saying, those guys must know more about the company than I do. If they're saying 15%, I'm using 3%, I must have done something wrong. Implicitly, you're assuming that analysts bring in all the special stuff into the growth rate. They've talked to the CEO. They have information you don't have. Let me dispel that delusion. At least with US companies, the competitive advantage that analysts have over you has almost disappeared. It used to be wider 30, 40 years ago. Remember, there was a tremendous advantage to being New York based 40 years ago. You know why? The SEC offices were in New York. You know how you got your hands on a filing? You actually physically had to go to the office with the name of the company and they'd give you the filings. So if you were in Des Moines, Iowa, God help you. How the heck were you going to get to an SEC office with all those filings? Today, you sit in front of a computer. The guy in Des Moines, Iowa sits in front of a computer. Somebody in Alaska sits in front of a computer. They all get in the SEC website. They have the same information. You think, but what about that information managers pass on to analysts? The SEC has cracked down so much on that phenomenon that you can, I mean, there's still some information that leaks out, but it's time. The amount of private information that analysts bring to forecast has become almost minuscule in the US. It's wider in some emerging markets where people are allowed to reveal inside information to some people and not others. So if you're doing an Indonesian company, there might be information in that growth rate. In the US, your growth rate of Facebook is just as good and just as informed as an analyst forecast of growth for Facebook. I know it's tough to believe, but if you don't get to that point, you're going to be substituting their growth rates for yours. That's the first proposition. 
The second is if there is any additional information that analysts get, even if it's in the form of rumors and kind of subtle information, it's coming from the managers of a company, right? You think, so what? Managers are know more about the company, but they're biased. The kind of information they're going to leak out is like the kind of information a journalist is going to get from a politician. It's not going to be the, the truth. It's going to be spin. You're getting a lot of spin in there, which explains why there are so many more buy recommendations than sell recommendations, because that spin is almost never negative spin. It's always going to, oh, you missed something. It's always good stuff. It explains why all American analysts magically become better analysts. You have more access to that information. And it also explains why there's so much correlation across analysts because they're spinning to all of them. They're all hearing the same spin. Now, there's a reason Warren Buffett said, I'm glad I live in Omaha, Nebraska because I don't have to listen to the spin constantly. And let's face it, if you're a New York analyst, you hang out with other analysts, you're getting spun the same way pushing up all your numbers or pushing down all your numbers. So here's the bottom, bottom line. When you sit down to value company, make your own judgment of growth. Look up the analyst forecast. It's, it's, it's pointless ignoring it. If your numbers are very different, ask yourself, is there something I might have missed? It's always a good place to start. Spend 24 hours, 48 hours digging. And if you cannot find anything, you know what the answer is? There's nothing explaining the difference. Just stick with your growth rate. It's your value for the company, not a Morgan Stanley analyst valuation of the company. So we talked about historical growth and how it can vary depending on how you estimate it. We talked about analyst growth. Not that useful. Let's turn to the third way of thinking about growth. And I want you to start thinking in these terms because I think too often we've outsourced how we think about growth. We let somebody tell us what growth rate to use, whether it's history, managers, or analysts. But remember what I said, ultimately growth comes from within the company. So I'm gonna set up a very simple algebraic setup. It's not, you know, it's not complicated to explain what allows some companies to grow fast and others not to grow that fast. Let's suppose you have a company with a billion dollars invested in existing projects. Let's say it's making 12% on those projects. 12% of a billion gives you earnings of 120 million, right? Let's assume this company is not gonna add anything to its investment base. It's gonna stay at a billion and that its return on capital is never gonna change. What's the growth rate gonna be for this company? If billion stays a billion, the return capital stays 12%, you'll make 120 million every year forever. If you don't add to your investment base and you don't improve your return on capital, algebraically, there can be no growth. Think of that the uninteresting case. Here's one way the company can grow. It can go out and take new projects. What does that do? It increases your investment base. Let's say it invests 100 million new projects. And let's say it's able to make 12% on those projects as well. Algebraically, if I look at the earnings next year, it's going to be 120 million from existing projects plus 12 million from new projects, I'm gonna get an earnings growth of 12 million next year, but think of where it came about. It came about because I added to my investment base and continued to earn my return on capital. I'm gonna take this very simple algebraic setup because this isn't a theory or a model, it's just the algebra of earnings and convert it into percentages. How much am I investing? 100 million, right? Out of 120 million in profit. If I divide the 100 by the 120, I'm going to call that my reinvestment rate. I'm putting back 100 million of my 120 million back into the business. So my reinvestment rate is 83.33%. What's the return I'm making? 12%. 83.33% times 12% gives me a growth rate of 10%, which is exactly what you saw as my growth rate in the previous page. 120 million to 132 million, it's a 10% growth rate. I've just taken the growth rate and said, here's where it's coming from. It's coming from the fact that you're reinvesting 83.33% of your earnings and earning a 12% return on capital. So that think of that as the first way to grow. Add your investment base, invest more, become larger. There's a second way to grow as well, without adding to your investment base. Remember we were making 12% return on capital in your existing projects? What if you become more efficient? What does that mean? So making 12%, if you can make 13%, or 15% on your existing base, 
is your earnings going to grow at least for next year, right? Because when you go from 12 to 15%, your income goes from 120 to 150 million. That's a 25%, it's actually more than that, right? Now 25% growth rate coming from efficiency. So there's reinvestment growth and efficiency growth. The difference though is efficiency growth cannot be long-term. Do you see why? You go from 12 to 15%. If you stay at 15% from that point on, after next year, your growth rate is going to go back to 0% because you're now at 150 million. You're saying, why can't I go from 12 to 15, 15 to 18? Eh? If you can pull it off, that'll be amazing. But remember, each time you try to improve it, you've already cut out the inefficiencies. So efficiency growth is finite growth. What that means is, if you have a company and you tell me it's going to grow over the next three years by cutting costs, I say, okay, that's feasible. If you tell me it's going to grow for the next 30 years by cutting costs, I'm going to get really skeptical. How can you keep cutting costs for the next 30 years? And if you tell me it's going to grow forever by cutting costs, I'm going to say that's not going to happen. Efficiency growth and reinvestment growth. So when I think about growth rates, what I'm thinking about is how much is this company reinvesting? How well is it reinvesting? And to measure those or get answers to those two questions, I first have to decide what metric I'm forecasting growth in. So I'm going to give you three variants and I'm putting them all on the same page. You can see I'm trying to do the same thing, but with different contexts. Three variants of what's called sustainable or fundamental growth. The first is if I'm trying to project growth in earnings per share. Right? That's often when you see equity research is on per share. If you want a growth rate in earnings per share, I'm going to measure how much you reinvest by looking at the percentage of your net income that you put back into the company that you don't pay out. You know what the dividend payout ratio is, right? It's dividends divided by net income. So if you have a payout ratio of 40%, you're retaining 60%. It's called the retention ratio. So I measure how much you reinvest with your retention ratio. And I measure how well you reinvest with the return on equity. Why? Because earnings per share is an equity earnings number. I've got to look at the return on equity. So I measure how much you reinvest with the retention ratio, how well you reinvest with the return on equity. If I'm trying to forecast growth in non-cash net income, in other words, the net income I make from my operating assets, I don't want to use retention ratios. And here's why. When a company retains earnings, does it automatically mean that they're reinvesting the earnings into projects? No, they can retain earnings and just put in a cash balance, right? So I want to get a cleaner sense of what you're reinvesting. So rather than trusting your retention ratio, I'm actually going to measure how much you're putting back into the company. And we already have measures for that, right? Net capex, change in working capital is what you're actually putting in. And because I'm looking at equity, I'm going to let you cover some of that with debt. So remember, we use the debt ratio. So 80% of your reinvestment comes from equity. That's called equity reinvestment. Dividing that by the net income gives you what's called an equity reinvestment rate. It's like a retention ratio, but it's focused on what you're actually putting back in the company. If that's your measure of reinvestment, the return that you make on that investment has to be measured with non-cash net income. Do you see why non-cash net income? Because you're now focusing on the income you're making from operating assets. So if you're making income from cash, interest income, you take that out. That makes your net income smaller. But you divide it instead by the book equity, you divide it by the book value of equity minus cash because that cash is not generating. It. It's called a non-cash return equity. Re equity reinvestment rate times non-cash return equity gives you growth in net income. And let's talk about growth in operating income. Now we're looking at the entire firm, right? The reinvestment rate now is net capex and change in working capital, total reinvestment as a percentage of after-tax operating income. I want this to become almost second nature by the time you're done with this class. When I ask you, how do you measure returns? You say, to, the equi to equity of the firm, because you can already see once you make that choice, everything is driven by that choice. And when I ask you, how well are you reinvesting when you're looking at operating income? Look at, look at return equity. I'm going to look at the return on all of the capital I've invested in the firm. And to measure that, I'm going to look at after tax operating income, that EBIT times one minus T, divided by not just book equity, but book equity plus book debt minus cash. That's called invested capital. 
I know these look like different equations, but they're really the same equation playing out in different ways, depending on whose perspective you bring to the game. These are called sustainable growth rates. And they're an incredibly useful base from which to think about growth rates. So let's try this on a company. Let's start easy. Let's start with earnings per share. I said, in, if you're looking at growth and earnings per share, I said it's retention ratio times return equity. So let's focus on retention ratio. What's the highest value a retention ratio can take? It's the highest percentage of your net income that you can keep in the firm. 100%, right? You can't have a 150% retention ratio. What's the lowest value a retention ratio can take? Zero. So retention ratios go from zero to 100%. You think, so what? So the highest value the retention ratio can take is one, 100%. You see where this is going to lead us? If your growth rate is your retention ratio times return equity, if you believe this equation, your growth rate in your earnings per share cannot exceed your return in equity. The highest growth rate you can have is with 100% retention ratio. So if your return equity is 15%, you say, how fast can I grow in the future? I'm going to say, look, the maximum growth rate you can have on earnings per share is 15%. If you push me and say, I'd like to grow faster, you know what I'm going to ask you? Can you increase your return equity? If you can, yes, you can grow faster. So that becomes a cap on your growth rate. So let's try this. Banks actually lend themselves very well to this equation because retention ratio you can get for a bank, return equity you can get for a bank. This is actually a valuation I did of Wells Fargo in June of 2008. I never run away from a valuation. June of 2008, you know what is coming down the pike, right? Three months later. I would love to tell you that I could see it coming. I had no idea. So June of 2008, when I sat down to value Wells Fargo, I pulled up its return equity, which was... 17.56%. Banks were doing really well in the middle of 2008 for lots of reasons, some good, some bad. 17.56%. Their retention ratio was 45%. So this is just whatever's not paid out as dividends as a person of net income. In June of 2008, if I asked you how quickly or what growth rate would you apply to Wells Fargo's earnings per share going forward? If you assume that these two numbers are stable and predictable, in other words, the return equity would stay at 17.56% and the retention ratio would stay at 45.37%, the expected growth in earnings per share, at least for the near term, next three years, next five years, for Wells Fargo is 7.97%. Of course, I'm making assumptions about maintaining these high returns in equity and maintaining the retention ratio. And three months later, of course, the crisis hit. And one of the things the crisis showed us was the regulatory capital at banks was insufficient. That was one of the lessons that came out of the crisis. So let's say it's three months later. Nothing new has come out from the firm. They have the same net income and the same dividends they had before the crisis. But here's the, the difference. The regulatory capital authorities have decided to raise the regulatory capital needs at banks by 30%. You know what that means, right? Basically, if you cut it, cut it down to reality, you're asking banks to go out and raise more equity and increase their book equity. Book equity and regulatory capital are very closely tied together. Same net income as before, right? But now your book equity has to increase by 30%. Same net income, book equity increases by 30%. What's going to happen to that return in equity that we calculated? It's going to go down. In fact, it's going to go down from 17.56 to 13.91%. You want to see how you get the 13.91? Just take the 17.56%, but make the denominator 30% larger. So basically, your return equity drops, even though you're still the same profitable bank. So this is not even bringing in any other shocks. Your return equity decreases. You're still paying the same dividends and the same net income, right? So your retention ratio stays exactly the same. But if you have lower return in equity now, you see what's going to happen to your growth in earnings per share? Lower return equity times the same retention ratio, your growth rate is going to drop to about 6% from 7.9% because the regulatory capital requirements have gone up. If you're valuing a bank, this is why you care so much about regulatory capital rules and what they're doing to your regulatory capital because it affects your return in equity for the long term. And through that, it affects your growth rate. 
let's uh, close the return equity discussion with, with a final twist. You'd like to have a higher return equity rather than a low return equity, right? No company says I'd like a low return equity. But there are two ways you can deliver a high return equity. One is to do what Facebook and Google and Apple are doing, which is take great projects. Make 30, 40, 50% return equity. The other is to take average projects and then use debt to kind of supercharge them. That's what real estate has done for, for 100 years, right? What do you do? You take a project that makes 10%, you go out and borrow money at 4%. Remember, you get a tax advantage, so that's like 3%. You're keeping 7% of every dollar you make for yourself as an equity investor. In fact, you can decompose the return equity for a company as a return on capital, which you'd have earned with no debt, plus a leverage effect. So the debt to equity ratio captures how much debt you've taken on. And this number inside the brackets is a measure of how much you're benefiting from borrowing money. The return capital is what you make on your projects. The after-tax cost of debt is what you pay out. So when you look at a company, you see a high return equity. Before you get too impressed, you might want to break it down. So as an example, it's valuing a company called Brahma. It's now called Ambev. It's a big Brazilian beverage company, the late 90s. Astonishingly high return equity, 31% ROE. So I want to see why its return equity was so high. It did have great projects. 19.9% .9 was the return on capital. So they'd use no debt, that would have been the return equity. But they used a debt to equity ratio of 77%. And they borrowed money after taxes at 5.6%. So think of what they're doing. They're starting with 19.9%. They're borrowing 77 cents for every dollar of equity. And they're making almost a 14.3% spread over the after-tax cost of debt. Return equity of 31%. Companies, and as I said, there are some sectors, but this is the name of the game, right? Take average projects push up the return equity by using less and less equity. But remember, for this to work, one condition has to be met, which is you have to earn more on your projects than what you pay out in your debt, like a minimalist condition. Now, I was born in a city called Chennai in India, and I hardly ever make it back. I've been gone for 43 years, but once every year I go back because my parents were still there for, and my mom still lives there. And somehow people seem to find out that I'm coming. So all of a sudden I get these invites. Can you come in and talk to our company about? And I can't say no, because many of these people I grew up with there, you know. So I remember about 20 years ago, land up, land back in Chennai. And I get called in by this company called Titan Watches. It's a well-regarded Indian watch company. And uh, the reason I couldn't turn it down is my uncle was on the board and he said, can you come in and talk to us? Because we're having a problem. I said, what's your problem? He said, he said, we read somewhere about how leverage can push up the return equity and we keep borrowing more money. And every time we borrow, our return equity seems to go down. I said, that's strange. So I took a look at the numbers and here's what I saw. I saw a return on capital of 9.5% in Indian rupees. Not bad, right? This is a time when risk-free rates in India were much, much higher. The debt to equity, clearly this guy, you know, my uncle wasn't lying, 191% debt to equity, they've gone crazy. The only problem is that after tax cost of debt had become 10.13%. You see what the problem is? Every time they borrow money, they pay out 10.1%. So leverage can very quickly turn on you if you cannot make your cost of debt. It happens in real estate all the time, right? When real estate is doing well, you deliver more than the cost of debt, debt is your friend. Real estate prices start dropping and your rents start to decrease. That very same debt that's your friend becomes something that can drag your return equity down. So when we start next session, we're going to continue with this fundamental growth. And we're also going to talk about the elephant in the room, the terminal value. So come prepared for growth and terminal value. But as I said, tomorrow you get an email about the quizzes. If not, day after tomorrow morning and you can come pick them up.